In more traditional skinning, you'll find that every vertex, in this example the white dot here, can be skinned to any arbitrary number of joints. In this case, I've marked them 1, 2, 3, and 4. The vertex needs to keep track of which joints it's skinned to. In this case, it's joint 1, 2, 3, and 4, with a weight of 0 0.4, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and 0 0.1. This will give a sum of 1, which is important in every case. Every frame will then calculate a transform that brings every joint from its rest position over to its new position. We then apply the same transform to vertex position to get it to it one of its new locations. The same is done for the other three joints, so that we now have a location for where the vertex would be if every joint had 100% influence. We then take the average of the four points that we now have, but we weight them by the weighting that we have stored in the vertex, which then becomes the new position for the vertex. For our example, we're going to use a model of a fern from Quixel. We are limited to four joints influencing one vertex, storing the indices in the vertex colors and the weights in the UV coordinates. The reason for this is that a vertex color can go between 0 and 1 in up to 255 steps. This means that it can hold 255 different values, which means it can store 255 indices. The reason we use the UV coordinates for the weights is because we want to go with a finer control than that. The UVs are typically 16-bit. If we look at the vertex colors, there's really not an awful lot to make out from this. So instead, let's try to apply a specific material. The material we'll be using will be using the debug scala values um, material function, which will let us see actual numbers for the values we pipe in. And we're just taking the vertex colors and multiplying them up with 255 and rounding the number. Once applied, when you zoom in on one of the leaves, you can see the index that's currently stored in the red channel. If we switch to the green channel, we can see the second influence, with the blue channel, the third influence, and with the alpha channel, we can see the fourth influence. We set up the entire rigging inside Houdini, where we take advantage of the fact that every leaf is a separate shell, and that Quixel have colored every leaf from top to bottom. So looping over each shell separately, we construct first the spine, and then we construct a number of branches for the hierarchy. We then use these lines in order to establish for every point what is the parent and the children. These newly generated points, or joints, are then skinned to the original mesh again. We export the joints as a Niagara Houdini point cache, which we can import with the Houdini Niagara plugin, with position and IDs for parent and children. We then take the skinned mesh and move the weights into the UV coordinates and the indices into the vertex colors. Looking inside the Fern Niagara system, we can see that we once again have a render target, but this time there are four rows of pixels repeated twice. Each row represents a column in a transformation matrix so that we can sample a full transform with four pixels. We store them twice so we can get the last frame's transforms, but we'll get back to that later. The first thing to do is to get the attributes from the Houdini point cache. So the Houdini point cache can be found imported into the project as HPC underscore Fern. While we initialize the rig in the particle spawn, we also initialize a number of values we need to use later, but these are done in the particle update. The reason for this is the particles or joints need to read information from their neighbors, but this information is not necessarily available on the first frame, so they need to repeat it a few frames before they store it. If we dive into one of them, we can see that we have a test here for when four ticks have happened. After four ticks, we finally store the values and no longer change them. You can visualize the hierarchy by turning on draw hierarchy lines. In the same way as with the rope, we have a solver stage, which takes care of pushing the points apart so they have the correct distance and angle to each other. Inside this module, we have a number of constraints set up. We have constraint for best distance to children, constraint for best distance to parent, and constraint for best angle to parent so that we can return to the original rest position. We also have the relay integration again, and we sum it all up with some soft and hard constraints, um, hard to make sure that we always try to force the points apart because you cannot compress a leaf along the stem, you can only bend it. And some softer ones like the volley integration and the angle because once you have bent it, it will take some time to return again. We also apply some collision and in the same way again, we check that we have passed enough ticks before we start doing anything. So in this case, it's greater than four. So we had the first four ticks to get everything ready and then after that we'll do the actual simulation.
For the cable example, we wrote the position of every particle straight into the render target. For the fern, because we need to wait between four different values, and because the, every point has not started in a straight line, what we need to do is calculate a transform matrix that reflects the translation and rotation relative to its parent that each particle or joint has gone through to be at its current location compared to its original location, so that we can transform every vertex in a similar manner. This involves taking the position, the parent's position, the original position, the original parent direction, and using them to construct a 4x4 transformation matrix that gives both the rotation scale and translation to move the joint from its original position to its current position. The matrix is then split up into four vector fours, each which are then written into a separate pixel. If we have a look inside the material, we can see the four transforms performed for each of the four joints with the weight set from the vertex colors RGB and alpha. We can also see the weight supplied from the text coordinate one and text coordinate two. Having a look inside one of these functions, we can see that we go through sampling the texture four times in order to construct the matrix, and we then apply it to transform the position, but also the normal and the tangent. This means that we have four positions, four tangents, and four normals that have been pre-weighted, and all they need to do is to be summed up. So the last thing to talk about is what was with the flip-flop value over here, and why did we have two different rows for our transforms? Well, in the material, there is a previous frame switch here, and down underneath here, we actually do the full calculation and entire extra time just for the positions. The reason for this is this is necessary in order to get correct motion vectors and could be disabled just by bypassing. And there you have it. So why don't you go download the project and have a look, see what you can learn and see what you can come up with yourself.